Bible says this. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And the church said, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Verse 35. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Oh, man, if you knew how good that was, you would jump up and shout. A slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Verse 36, the one we've been trying to get to for weeks now. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I'm going to try that again for all my saints. Here we go. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I love that. Hey, if you're taking notes in this fourth part of free indeed, I've entitled it this. Free for real. Free for real. Let's pray. I like that. For real, for real. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you once again for this day. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And God, I thank you that before the earth began to spin on its axis, God, you knew each and every person that was going to be here. You're not surprised by anybody that showed up to a birthday party, but there's something bigger to celebrate, and his name is Jesus. I pray that I lie down. As you rise up, don't let these words be my own, but let them come directly from your throne room of grace, hoping hearts, minds, and ears to be receptive to a word that will always be about Jesus. I pray that somebody gets free in this place today, but, but, but not some fabricated freedom. I pray that they're free for real. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, everybody said, give Jesus one more shout of praise. Week one, we started off this, this series, and um, I started off with a message. I entitled it, What Do You Know? What do you know? Um, the Bible says, you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, here's the reality. Depending on the truth that you know, it's going to dictate what kind of freedom you live in. See, some people have their truth or my truth. And if you live in your truth, all it's going to do is put you in bondage. Your truth can't free you, but the truth can set you free. You can live in your truth all you want to. If if, if you live in your truth, you make yourself the center of the universe. But how many of you know that Jesus is the King of Kings? Jesus is the Lord of Lords. And Jesus is the only universal truth that will set you free. If you believe that, say amen. So we started talking about what do you know? And then the following week, we had a message called No Longer Slaves. And we talked about the fact that the, the, the Israelites, man, they, they were wild because they said, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. But that statement in the context uh, of the day did not make any sense because they were telling Jesus they had never been slaves. But you and I know because we read the book that they've been slaves to the Egyptians. And the whole point of it is that you can't operate in freedom when you're delusional. (laughs) They were delusional. They believed something that was not a reality. So you got to be honest with yourself and you got to admit it. Jesus is the only thing that can save you from yourself. And we talked about the fact that it's the small decisions that you're going to make in 2020 that's going to make it better than 2019. The little bitty decisions each and every week. And then last week, for our worship night, my dear wife preached. Could we give it up for Mrs. Wilson? Thank you once again, baby girl, for standing by my side from day one in this. There is no cool church without you. So can y'all give it up for Mrs. Wilson one more time? Love you. She preached a message called Suddenly Free. How I many you know we serve the God of suddenly? You could, be, you, you could be a slave to something forever and suddenly God can free you. Suddenly God can break an addiction. Suddenly God can save your marriage. Suddenly God can bless your bank account. Suddenly God can bless you with the career you were looking for. Suddenly God can change your life. But here's the problem. You can't just get free suddenly. You got to continue to walk in that freedom once you get it. Some people get freed suddenly and then run back to the same change that God suddenly freed them from. In order to stay free, you got to continually walk in your freedom. And and my wife blessed us with that word last week. And now I asked myself this question in in week four on the anniversary of Cool Church's birth. Are we free for real? Like there's so many people like we come and we like do the church thing. But like, are you really free? 
Maybe you come down to an altar and like you felt good when you were here, but as soon as you walked out the door, something challenged your freedom. And you didn't feel the freedom that you felt when you stood down here. Are you free for real? I think the, to know if you're free for real, you got to start asking yourself some very healthy questions. And the first question I would ask myself is this. Are you a slave or a son? Are you a slave or a son? Because the Bible tells me in John 8, 35, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Very quickly, Jesus is telling us that the difference between a slave and a son is position. A slave doesn't have a permanent position. But a, but a son does. There's a big difference between a son and a slave. Slaves take what they can get, but sons don't stress because they know that more is coming. Slaves never get rest because they don't know where home is, but sons sleep easy because they know they always got a home to come back to. Slaves live in fear of their masters, but sons live in the love of a father. Slaves are not heirs. They have no place in the family. But sons can't be sold. They can't be cast out because they have the father's blood running through their veins that make them heirs to whatever the father has. You see, the son has a confidence in the love of his father that a slave could never have in relationship to his master. So sons walk around, daughters as well, <laughs> with their heads held high. And their shoulders back, knowing that there is a father that loves them. While slaves walk around with their head down, just trying to stay out of the master's way. Nobody understood sonship, I believe, better than the Apostle Paul. And he writes this in Romans chapter 8, 14 through 17. It says, but those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live in faith. Fear again, rather, the spirit received brought about your adoption to sonship. I love that he talks about adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Such a beautiful name for God. Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are what? We are heirs. I love that because being a child of God means that you got access to something that nobody else has access to. We are heirs of God. We are walking, talking, living, breathing royalty because God is our father and he is a king. So just by our proximity to him, we are royalty as well. Why do you think we call our young kings young kings? Because they are heirs. Because they know who their father is. I love it because the Bible says they're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I love this because now God has pulled us up through adoption to the level that Christ is on. Christ is his actual son, his blood son. The blood runs through him. But because we are adopted now, we are co-heirs. Not only we are we adopted, it's actually better than that. God's given us all a blood transfusion that makes us co-heirs because now we share the blood of God in us. It's a beautiful sentiment. It says if we are heirs of God, cores of Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory, we have access to something because God has adopted us. I don't think anybody understands this better than Paul. And this word that we find, this name of God, Abba Father, I just want to rest here for a second because it's a it's a it's a very Beautiful and complex word while being simple at the same time. Uh, uh, Abba in the Aramaic is translated as father. So it's almost like it's saying father, father, but it's better than that. It's, it's, it's deeper than that because it's not just talking about God as a father. Yes, we know that God is the father. It's a more intimate version of the word father. So it's not actually father. It's actually like saying daddy. It's like saying daddy. Daddy, like we know that there are fathers out there, but there's not a lot of dads. Like this, this is not, this is Abba Father is not talking about when it says Father, Father, it's not the Maury Povich version that says you are not the father. It's not that. But it's something different than that. This is, this is a relational word for father. Now he's talking about daddy, daddy. And it's interesting because only 
Only two people in the entire Bible use this word. One is Jesus. The other is Paul. There's only three times it's mentioned. One by Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's praying. God, not my will. Let your will be done. And God in that moment comes and he, he allows the angel to strengthen him. And then Christ in this moment almost goes through some sort of transformation as to where he is now resolute on his path to the cross. It's not that he's not scared, but God's given him a boldness to go do what he designed him to do on the cross. But then Paul comes back and uses this, this same word. He uses it once in Galatians and once in Romans, as I just read to you. And I think it's very beautiful that he uses this word, because if you could talk about two people that were on totally opposite sides of the spectrum, it's Jesus and Paul. Jesus is actually God's son. Paul hated Christians. His name was Saul. He killed Christians. He had a Damascus Road experience where he was literally blinded by the light. He saw Jesus face to face and Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was literally blinded for three days. Scales fell off his eyes. And from that moment forth, his life was now transformed. So both of these men went through something transformational. And the other thing that these men both have in common is that they both suffered terribly for the cause of Christ. Jesus, we know, had to endure the cross. But Paul, like, like some of y'all had this misconception, like, oh, I'm going to get saved today and my life's going to be better. Stop. Paul got saved. His life got worse. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm, just being, I'm just being real. I'm preaching. One. It's like, well, why would I ever want to do that? Because he knew that what he was going for was not about what he was physically enduring. He knew that he had a home that was beyond where he already was. So, so, so Paul now uses this term, Abba, Father, with all the stuff that he went through. He's like, Daddy, Daddy, what, what was he trying to say? I have such a love and an intimate relationship with my father, with my dad. It does not matter what I am physically going through. It's not going to change how I feel about him. Yeah. He's my dad. Good or bad, he's my dad. Yeah. That's what Paul is trying to let us know. And it's the same reason Jesus said, Abba, Father, He's like, hey, cross or no cross, you are still my father. Men that had to go up against such intense persecution understood that God was a father. And I would say Paul even more so because Paul, like you and me, was an adopted son. It's one thing for your actual blood son to know. It's a whole nother thing for your adopted son to call you daddy, especially when you had to go through a mess. I understand this verse in a little bit of a different context, but I have clarity because um, I have a, a now nine year old who in two weeks will be a 10 year old daughter. And yeah. her name is Valencia, a.k.a. Va Va Voom Wilson. But if you did not know, if I did not tell you because I don't usually call her by what the world would call her, I just say she's my daughter. But in actuality, she's my adopted daughter. We adopted her from the beautiful island nation of Haiti about six years ago and she has been the greatest blessing in me and my wife's entire life so when you see me talk about my daughter I, I never say my adopted daughter I say she's my daughter because she's my daughter and I wish you would mess with my daughter because I will take my pastor hat off and put my Carol City hat back on you don't want it So as I'm raising my daughter, I love my daughter. And I remember the days when she first came here, she didn't speak English. Now she know a little bit too much English. <laughs> Some days I wish you can go back. Man, I remember when I didn't understand what you were saying. I thought everything you was whispering to me was sweet nothings. <laughs> now I have some things, I'm like, you are something else. I love my baby girl. She's not always good. Sometimes she's not so good. And as a parent, what do I have to do? I got discipline. I got discipline my baby girl. Why do I do it? Not because I don't like her. I love her. And I'm trying to guide her on the right path. By the way, if you need help with parenting and you want to understand some better tips on how to parent, we actually have parenting classes here at Cool Church taught by Lucy and Leo. You can sign up for them. You ain't got to beat your kids into oblivion, man. There's ways. There's things that you can do. I know. It ain't just you. It's me. Got parenting classes. But as I, try to, as I try to parent my daughter, there's moments where I have to discipline her. Moments where I know she may not necessarily be happy with me because I have to discipline her. Yeah. Right? And I've made it a habit 
because she fully understands what being adopted means. She knows that she did not come from me and my wife. She knows that she comes from another family, but she accepts the fact that she is a part of our family. She's not dumb. She knows that. We've had those conversations. So there's times where she gets punished. And, and I always say, baby girl, hey, you know I love you no matter what, right? Hey, no matter what, I am always going to be your dad. I always tell her that. You know how she responds every time? Even if she mad, I know daddy. <laughs> I still love you. And it blesses me because my child loves me knowing that she does not fully come from me. Why? Because she has a very good understanding that a lot of Christians don't have. There are so many Christians that feel like because they make a mistake, they are no longer a part of the family. That is the most toxic bit of thinking that you can have in 2020. Her mistakes have no bearing on her placement in our family. No matter what, she's a Wilson. I have fought for her to have that name. And there's nothing she can do to get rid of that name. But some of us, we treat God like if we do something wrong, then we got to separate ourselves from him like we're getting kicked out of the family. When God's saying, you're always a part of the family. You're always a part. I've seen it. There's people that miss church on Sundays because they know. They know that they miss so many weeks that they think that God is done with them. It's not true. Just folks that were somewhere last night that they know they probably shouldn't have been. And they ain't come today because they think God is done with them. There are folks that cussed some folks out last week. And you said, I'm going to keep my body mind out of church because God is done with me. It's not true. There are people that are involved with somebody that they shouldn't have been involved with since 2019 and you stayed with them anyway, but God told you you should have got out of there because that relationship was abusive. It was toxic for you. So you decided to grab on to toxicity and stay away from the family when you actually should have let go of what was toxic and run towards the family. God's not done with you because of who you're with. There are some folks that are addicted to something. And you know what you do? You stay away, a away from church and you say, I'm going to come back when I beat this thing. That's toxic, man. Because you can't beat it without your father. You can sit over here and try to beat it all that you want to. You're going to fight a losing battle. God doesn't even call you to fight. He calls you to stand and say, hey, let me fight for you. But you want to beat something when you need to be in the place with the person that's already given you victory over everything. Valencia understands that a daughter or a son belongs to the family forever. As it says in John 8, 35, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. I'm trying to let somebody hear me. I want somebody to have this resonate in your spirit. There is no expiration date on your relationship with Jesus. I looked it up in the Hebrew and in the Greek and that word forever means forever. It means it keeps on going. It means infinite. It means continual. It means everlasting. You say, I always got my relationship with God. I'm saying, yeah, as long as you choose to. See, some of y'all have given up on God when he's never given up on you. We make a choice to walk away from God and he's standing there just waiting for you to come. As a matter of fact, that's not even a good picture because while you're walking away, he's still following you. Some of you, you have turned your back on the one thing that could change your life forever because you feel like you have done something to not be a part of what Jesus... Let me tell you something. This, this, Jesus dying on the cross doesn't make sense if, if, if God doesn't keep coming after you. None of, it, none of it makes sense. Why would I sacrifice my own blood son for adopted children if I wanted to abandon Abandon the people that I sent my son to die for. That makes no sense. I don't know about y'all, but 
But the reason I ain't a good God, because I ain't sacrificing my children for y'all. God does that. And people still have this mentality. God abandoned me. No, he didn't. You abandoned him. You left him standing there waiting on you, loving on you, and he still pursues you because he loves you. Stop taking yourself away from God when he's never taken himself away from you. You see, a slave will continue to go back to things that are bad for them, but a son knows to stay home even when it hurts. Are you a slave or a son? And once you've asked yourself these questions, you have to really think about, man, am I really free? Am I free? Look what the Bible says. The bank come up, John 8, 36. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. The son, the son sets you, you're free indeed. How, how do you know if you're really free? This is the question that we started with. I know believers that go through the motions of Christianity, but still don't know if they're really free. Say, what are you talking about? I know folks whose worship has become a show to convince everybody they are free, but behind closed doors, they're struggling when nobody sees, going through the motion. I know folks whose prayers are loud and bold to mask the fact that they don't even have faith in what they're actually praying for. You're just going through the motions. I know folks who show up every week because you know it's the right thing to do, but you don't feel like you're seeing the impact the other six days a week. You're just going through the motions. And listen to me, church, if you're not careful, you can become a slave to the motions of Christianity and not be freed by the movement of Christ. If you're not careful, you become a slave to the motions. I, let, let me tell you something. I live in a place of, of humility about what God has done. Anybody on team knows, I always say, I don't want to be jaded by this. Because I know that without Christ, I am nothing. So the Bible says, who the Son sets free. Who the Son. You notice it doesn't say who Christ sets free, or who Jesus sets free, or who the Savior sets free, or who the Messiah sets free. It says who the Son sets free. You know why? Because it takes a son to make a son. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, my name is Terrence Wilson. Guess where I got my last name from? My father. If I didn't get my last name from my father, my name would be Terrence Carrington, which is my mother's maiden name. But in order for the Wilson name to continue, it gets passed from fathers to sons. Fathers to sons. It don't just take a son to make a son. God knew that it took a son to save a son. See, we are saved based upon the actions of God's son, Jesus, which is why we are adopted into this family. Had it not been for Jesus, the adoption would not be complete because Je Jesus loved us so much, he gave us his name, his last name, Jesus Christ. What are we? Christians. Takes a son to make a son. Took a son to save some sons, to save some daughters out there. Jesus loved us so much, he gave us his name. You don't have to feel like you're on an island because you're adopted. You don't have to feel like the odd kid out. Jesus said, I died to make you part of this family who the son sets free. Stop there. That word free is beautiful. But then it says who the son says free is free indeed. If you're not careful, you will think that that's the exact same word. It's translated the same way, free and free. But that word in the Greek, the first free is a word called eleuthro. Eleuthro in the Greek. And it's a beautiful word because it means this. It means to make free or set at liberty from the dominion of sin. Set at liberty from the dominion of sin. But then it says, who the son says free, that's one, is free, whole different word, Eleuthros. Eleuthros actually means this, freeborn. Freeborn 
free from the yoke of the Mosaic law. Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. The sun sets free is free indeed. Those two words are a root word for another word I've used so often called eleutrophobia, which means the fear of freedom. I know a lot of Christians that live in the fear of freedom. That word actually comes from the Hebrew people who were slaves in Egypt. They got out. They were they were walking in the wilderness and God gave them supernatural food. They hit a, a rock and water came out. Manna fell from heaven and they got mad at God for giving them supernatural food. They got so mad. They said, we want to go back to the slave food in Egypt. We want the meat from the pots that our masters left behind for us. Some of you don't want supernatural food. You want slave food. So you keep going back to it. You keep you keep going back to something that has kept you in bondage. Some of us have allowed our slavery to convince us that freedom is a bad thing. You say, what do you mean? Why well, come to church on Sunday when I can experience the freedom in the turn up Saturday night? That's toxic, man. That freedom will kill you. Why get married when I can sleep with whoever I want right now? That will kill you. Why give my life to Jesus when I can be the master of my own destiny? You've allowed slavery to convince you that freedom is a bad thing. That's not real freedom. Newsflash. It's not real freedom. Here's what Christ is truly telling us in that verse. Who the son sets free. Ele you throw is free indeed. Ele you thrust. Who the sun sets free, Eleuthero. Who the sun sets at liberty from the dominion of sin is free born from the yoke of the Mosaic law. Who the sun sets at liberty from the freedom of sin is free born from the yoke of the Mosaic law. Let me break it down for you. This is what Christ is truly saying for you. If I have saved you from the bondage of sin, then you are free to live in grace with no context or no boundaries or no strings attached based upon the law. I freed you from bondage, not to run back to the law, but to operate in the grace that I died for for you. So if the son sets you free, you are not reborn, you are freeborn. Look at your neighbor and say, I am freeborn. Look at each other neighbor say, I am born free. Christ died and paid the sacrifice for you to live in his grace, in his freedom. You are not just born again. You were born free. I need somebody to understand, though, that this freedom comes with no strings attached. I was Christmas shopping during this last season, and I went to the store, and I ain't going to the store. I should have done all my shopping online, but I didn't. I wasn't smart, but as I'm looking up in the aisles, I saw a big old sign that said, free, free Google Home Mini. I said, oh, snap. Let me run over there and see if I can grab one. And I'm thinking in my head, yo, if you got, if you're giving away free technology, you know, by the time you get there, they all going to be gone. So I get there. I see a massive mountain of Google Minis. I'm like, shoot, maybe I'm the first one here. Yeah. Maybe ain't nobody pick up on this thing yet. Yeah. Shoot. I said, I said, it's free. I pick, I pick one up. I like put it in my car. I was like hiding it. Like, man, I put like a few on my car. I was, like, I was like, maybe nobody will see. But then I started to think. I said, hold up. If it's free, why are all these here? I ain't the only one in this store. I, I, I'm, I'm smart, but I know there's other smart folks out there. And I look, and I said, I looked at the sign again. It said, it said, it said, free, big, it's massive. It's a tiny little print. It said, free, Google Home Mini with purchase of Google Hub. See, 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 they tried to get your pastor. They thought they got me, but see, I'm smart. I got my education. I read the fine print. 
They thought that they was going to get a brother, but they can't fool me. You want me to pay five times the amount for this just so I can get this for free? That's not free. I just want to give a simple word to somebody. There's nothing that's free in this world. There is not one thing in this world that is free. The truth is the world doesn't give you anything for free. But the sun is different. Because it's freedom. It came at a cost, but not at a cost to you. You see, the sun died so that we could be free and free indeed. It's not free with the purchase of It's not free after instant rebate. It's not free with strings attached. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is receive the freedom that Christ died for. See, you know you're truly free when you know you don't have to, you get to. I don't have to come to church, but I get to come and be around my family. I don't have to read my Bible, but I get to read God's promises. I don't have to give in the tithe and offering play, but I get to be generous because I serve the God that's given me more than I could ever imagine even when I don't deserve it. I don't have to tell people about Jesus, but I get to share good news in a world of bad news. I don't have to be a slave. I get to be a son, a son of the most high God, Because when you're a son or daughter of God, there is no price you have to pay because the son Jesus already paid the price for you. So when it says, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It means you aren't just free. You're free for real. You're not just free in the world's standards because the world will always try to attach something to your freedom. Anytime somebody tries to free you in the world, they're going to ask you for something back. But Jesus is not like that. He is free. He's free for real. No cost to you. No stipulations. No fine print. He died to give you freedom. Let me ask you, are you open enough to receive it?